James chapter 1. Hallelujah. Verse 4. And if you're there, let me hear you say a big amen. 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 Hallelujah. Say with me, the Bible says. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be what? Perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And it's funny how people don't want to pray, pray for patience. But the Bible says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. How many want that in their life? That's a blessing from the Lord right there. Hallelujah. This verse brought up two questions. First, what is the perfect work of patience? And second, if patience has a specific work to do, what about each of the other portions of the fruit of the Spirit? And I can't help but believe that each segment of the fruit of the Spirit has something beyond its own presence to accomplish in our lives as we mature. Amen? While we're using uh, fruit as a metaphor, think about what happens to fruit as it matures. It ripens. As starch is transformed into sugar, sour gives way to the deep, delicious sweetness. Uh, yesterday, or day before yesterday, Lola was at the house, and I had a mango. Anybody like mangoes? And this mango was getting ripe. And so you would, I tried to cut it, but it was so ripe, it was just kind of, you know, juicy, squishy. And so I said, you're just going to have to take it and just eat it like this. She takes it in her hands, and it's just a mess. And she goes, who cares about manners? <laughs> who cares about manners? And she was just chewing on that. It was just a mess. Amen? But hallelujah for ripe fruit. Amen? Amen. So have you ever run into a starchy Christian? They need their fruit to ripen. Can I hear an amen? amen? And as the sweetness builds, the flesh of the fruit, like ours, yields more and more easily. With patience, the perfect work, you're going to learn something today if you listen. You know, you, gotta, you have your spiritual ears on, say amen. amen. So with patience, the perfect work of maturity comes and a rock hard, sour object is transformed into something that is almost universally loved. This brings another point to mind. We have all had a piece of fruit that has been roughly handled. Are you listening? It isn't just the exterior that takes the damage. It goes all the way through. And when we are interacting with new believers, remember they are immature and they may be a bit tough and they may be a bit rough and a bit sour. Handle with care. Turn to your neighbor and say, handle with care. Don't push so hard that you leave a bruise. With that in mind, let's explore our initial questions and see how far they will take us. We are going to start with question number two. If patience has a specific work to do, what about each of the other portions of the fruit of the Spirit? We will also move patience to the end of the line where it will patiently wait. Amen. It will probably have to wait a couple of weeks as there is no way we could adequately cover everything at once. Amen. So in Galatians chapter 5, if you have your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23. I believe that you have your notes with you. You can maybe move ahead. In the New King James Version, the Bible says, it tells us that the elements which comprise of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, long-suffering, which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Amen? So number one, love. So, that, so what is the work of love? What is the work of love? Are you ready? 
In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. You guys can talk to me a little bit this morning. I'll be a little quiet. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Say with me, the Bible says. And above all things have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, say with me, the Bible says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. So, simply put, love covers sins. And if we really give that thought, it's a heavy work. Much, much easier said than done. We're taking the approach that each of the parts of the fruit of the Spirit have a work to do. And I think it's probably right that, the, that, that love is at the very top of the list. Amen? Covering a multitude of sins, covering all sins is an incredible job. It really fits, though, when you think about John 3.16. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have ever everlasting life. What did that gift of love do? That gift of love, it covered all sin. Can I hear a great big amen? Hallelujah. To do that kind of work, a love has to be indescribably strong. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Hallelujah. This is describes, the scripture describes how love behaves. You ever say, behave yourself? You ever tell your kids, behave yourself? Sheree says, get control of yourself. Control your body. Control yourself. I've heard her say that to her kids. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. Say with me, the Bible says. Love suffers long and is what? Kind. kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity. When somebody sins, when you see somebody falling, when you see someone sin, you don't rejoice in that. You grieve in that and you pray for them. You don't talk about them. You pray for them. Can I hear a great big amen? amen. But the Bible says, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. And verse 8 continues to tell us that love never fails. That is the strength of love. Hallelujah. Most of this passage is about the behavior, the attitude of love. And it, this is worth knowing because it takes this attitude of love to produce the end result of covering the sin. Are y'all awake? Yeah. With an attitude any less than this, all sins could not be covered. In all this, the one thing that I love the most about love is that love never fails. Amen. Hallelujah. Love never fails. In the Song of Solomon, hallelujah, chapter 8, verses 6 through 7, the Bible describes the strength of, of love as well. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? This is pretty powerful. Set me as a seal upon your heart. As a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death. Jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire. A most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Nor can floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. All the wealth of a man's house is a penance compared to the value of love. Hallelujah. And no wonder. Love is powerful. Hallelujah. Love is so strong. The, the Bible says love is as strong as death. What an odd but perfect statement. The wages.
wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Only love could replace death with eternal life. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Love covers some sin. What does it cover? But it does more than just that. There's one other work of love that we need to look at. Let's turn to 1 John. 1 John, verses 4. Chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. 1 John, chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. And when you're there, let me hear you say a big amen. amen. Say with me, the Bible says. The Bible says. You know, I hear people read the Bible sometimes and then they'll say, it says. Well, what's it? It's the Bible. We need to say, the Bible says. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Someone asked me the other day, I think it was John McGurvin. He said, you always say the Bible says. I kind of get used to that. I say that now. The Bible says. And he, where'd you get that? And I said, well, Billy Graham says that all the time when he preaches. The Bible says. Amen. And he's a pretty good preacher. <coughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Say with me, the Bible says. Bible. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. The statement, he who fears has not been made perfect in love, shows that there's a process of development in our love. Amen? This means we start in an imperfect state. And the Holy Spirit moves us towards perfection and towards maturity. There is room here for a moment of a self-examination. A moment of reflection. If you want to know how mature you are in love, look at the two things that work uh, of love that impacts. First, Love covers all sins. How do you respond when someone sins against you? Does the love that was set inside of you cover that sin? Think about this. Christ took all sin, all sin from all time, and he bore the consequences of it. And he wasn't the least bit angry or resentful about any of it. When someone does wrong to us, we may see some consequences, consequences that we don't deserve. Does the love inside of you cover that sin? Or does yourself evaluate your importance as greater than Christ did his own? Does indignation rise up within you? Or is venge and vengeance is yours? Or does your self-evaluate your importance as greater than Christ in his own? Love keeps, the Bible says, love keeps no records of what? Love covers all sin. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 3 verse 14. Is it getting you today? Are you getting it? Yeah. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. Say with me, the Bible says. The Bible says, but put all these things, but above all these things, put on what? Love, which is a bond of perfection. Oh, man. Y'all are not awake today. Lord, I pray you just wake them up. If we are to be unified as the body of Christ, there's only one way for this to happen. That way is love. That way is maturing in love and letting love have its perfect work in us. Can I hear an amen? amen. There's a key to this process in love in, in Jesus' statement in Matthew. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39. Hallelujah. Say with me, the Bible says. Jesus said to him, 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your what? Your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right here, there is a perfect blend between the first work of love, covering all sin, and the second work of love, casting out all fear. Hallelujah. We can only be unified within ourselves if the love of our heart, soul, mind are focused on him. He is the only safe place for us to invest our love. Hallelujah. Where is your love invested? Hallelujah. Is there room for fear? Or is your love set on him? He will never hurt me. He will never betray me. He will never disappoint me. He seeks only for my good. Hallelujah. He guides me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He's my all in all. Hallelujah. That's my God. Hallelujah. And when my love is safely entrusted to him, then and only then will I mature in love because then I will have his love to share with those around me. Hallelujah. My love is safe and sound with him, but I can be obedient, but I can be obedient and love my neighbor as myself when I do it with his love. Say his love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He knows the hearts of men and he's willing to extend his love to us. Anyway, it may seem backwards, but the process of maturing in love comes with devoting all of your love solely to the Lord. Amen? And, and then picking up his love for others. When you love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, everything else starts to fall into place. You stop thinking about yourself. You stop thinking about everything about you. You start thinking about God and what God would like. What, would, what can I do that would please God? What can I do to make my father happy today? What can I say to make him happy today? What can I, how, what can I do? What can I say? How can I be to make my God happy today? How can I please him? Because I love him so much. How can I please him? Oh, Jesus. I've discovered that love, the love he has for his people is contagious. And it's worth catching. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's worth catching. Number two. Joy, say joy. joy. Joy is unique in that it's active in all three arenas of our existence. Physical, soulish, and spiritual. In Isaiah 61, 10, the Bible says, I greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Say that with me. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He's covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments. As a bride adorns herself with jewels. He brings great joy. He's covered me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm clothed and I'm covered in the garments of salvation and with a robe of righteousness. That feels good. I don't know about you, but it feels good. Hallelujah. If that doesn't make you joyful, I don't know what would make you joyful. My soul rejoices in my God and in my King. He's my Medicine. It's 
good to make somebody laugh. It's good to laugh. I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. You can't tell it like I can. What he's done for me. It's a good song, gotta learn it. I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. Hallelujah. I wasn't gonna do that, but I did. <laughs> joy has multiple jobs to do. There's one verse that stands out to describe that work of joy. Let's turn to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. You're there, let me hear you say a big amen. amen. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Say with me, the Bible says. Amen. Now may the God of hope fill you with some joy. Amen. What? Amen. All joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the God of hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This doesn't say that he fills us directly with hope, though. Here the end result of joy and peace and believing is hope. This is a prayer that God would fill us with all joy and peace. And what is that related to? What is it related to? It's related to us believing. Say believing. believing. If we believe, we will abound in hope. Believing brings joy. Joy brings hope. Let's take this thought to its foundational point. If we believe in him, we'll be drawn to know him. We'll be drawn to enter in his presence. And the Bible says in his presence is fullness of joy. You will show me the path of life, the Bible says in Psalm 1611. And in your presence, in your presence, in your presence, in your presence is fullness of joy. You need to get in his presence. You want joy? Get in his presence. Praise the name of Jesus. If you keep my commandments. What is the greatest commandment? <clears throat> to love the Lord, your God, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your... What? And the second? Love your neighbor as yourself. So let's put it together with what Christ said to John in John 15. He said, if you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in His love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Where does He want us to stay? In His love, in His presence, that your joy may be Oh, come on, this is good. This is really good. Say, say, where does he want you to stay? In his, in his what? In his love? In his presence? That your what? Joy may be what? What do you got to do? You got to stay in his love? You got to stay in his presence? That your joy may be? You got to stay in his love? You got to stay in his presence? So that your what? Baby one, come on, hallelujah. hallelujah, don't miss the power of the combination here, joy brings hope and in his presence is fullness of joy, in his presence our hope is fulfilled, hallelujah, joy has more work to do than just bring hope though, you want to know what else, let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10, Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10 and I'm almost finished, Hallelujah. Say with me, the Bible says. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, the Bible says, tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. 
Wait, let's just read that again. And then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord is your what? When do we need strength? When we have a load to carry or a hard road to walk? Scriptures remind us that our joy is not determined by our circumstance, but by our believing. In Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. This describes a horrific circumstance, but it concludes, I will be joyful. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, the Bible says, Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 14, the Bible says, In the day of prosperity, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider. Surely God has appointed the one as well as the other, so that man can find out nothing that will come after him. We may not be in the circumstances set forth in Habakkuk or sorrowful in the moment, but we will, say we will, yeah. but we will most certainly face trials when we believe. In James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says it won't be a struggle, but the supernatural result of the Holy Spirit inside us. The Bible says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Hallelujah. And if James' words uh, seem unreasonable, or if you recognize that your joy is lacking even outside of trials, there's a clear place to look. Look at your belief. It is quite impressive how clearly the scriptures link believing with joy. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 8 through 9 the Bible says whom having not seen you love though now you do not see him yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Believing causes us to rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. A joy unspeakable and full of glory, full of glory, full of glory. Hallelujah. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. In John chapter 16, verse 24, this reinforces the point. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. When do we receive? When we ask, believing. Remember James 1. Verses 6 through 7, the Bible says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. It all comes back to believing. In Psalm 119, 111, the Bible says, Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever for they are the rejoicing of my heart in Psalm 19 8 the Bible says the statues of the Lord are right rejoicing the heart the commandment of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes when we believe in the Lord his words bring joy to our heart it all comes back to believing. Simply believe. In Philippians chapter 4 verse 4, the Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. How 
are we supposed to position? How are we in a position to rejoice in the Lord? I'm going to ask you one more time. How are we in a position to rejoice in the Lord? Only through faith and only by believing. Would you stand with me? Perhaps the most wonderful scripture about joy is in Luke chapter 10, verse 20. You want to hear it? Yes. Say with me, the Bible says. The Bible says. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Are your hearts ready? I'm expecting Jesus to come soon. I'm so ready. I'm so ready to hear that trumpet blast. And I'm ready to hear the roar of praise when we meet each other in the sky. I don't think we're going to be quiet. It might be for a second. But when you realize you made it, some of you are going to be doing a happy dance. Some of you that have been so reserved, we're going to look at you and go, oh, you got it in you. You, really <laughs> you can really dance. You can really praise. Some of you really want to praise. On the inside, you're just like, oh, How many know that God is good? Amen. Amen. Jesus came across the universe because he knew I needed help. I needed him. And if I think, if I was the only one here left on earth, I think he would come just for me. If you were the only one here, he'd come just for you. You are his creation, created in his image. Amen? He came all the way across from his beautiful throne, kingdom. He was perfect, pure, holy. And he came across the universe because he was thinking about you, Celeste. And he was thinking about me. He was thinking about you, Evelyn. So I gotta go, I gotta go get my kids. I gotta go take their punishment because they can't cover it because sin is so rampant. See, so he comes in because he loved us. Say love. Yeah. And he gave his life. It covered all our sins. But we have to what? Believe. Gotta believe in Christ. You know what's so incredible? I love him so much because when he died on the cross for me and I believed, and I said, Father, forgive me of my sins. I repent. And I believed. He took that sin. He took that sin and he removed it to be remembered no more. You can't go forward, guys, in life until you cut off what's holding you back. Stop dragging around the sin, man. It's, it's heavy. It's heavy. You can't go forward. You cannot go forward if you keep looking back. And you can't go forward if you keep living in the guilt and the sin and the past. You can't. You have to cut it off. God did because he loved you and when you do you love the Lord with all your soul with all your mind with all your strength you love him you love him you love him and when you love him that love inside is going to become so powerful and so strong that you're going to love others in fact you're going to be able to forgive others so easy because you have the love of God inside of you because the more you fall in love with him it's easy it's just easy Trust me, but it's not easy letting go of the flesh. 
have your personal funerals. I call them that. Amen. Would you just close your eyes for a moment? I'm going to ask you a question. If Jesus would come back for you today, if by chance something happened, you know, he could come for you in a moment. You could have a heart attack. You could be in a car wreck. Anything could happen. But when that happens, are you sure in your heart that you're ready to meet Jesus? See, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift. It's a free gift. You can't buy it. It's freely given to you. You just have to receive him. But if you're here today and you've not received Jesus Christ in your heart as your personal Savior, but you really, really want to, don't let a day go by without receiving him. If you're here, just raise your hand this morning. I want to pray with you. Is anyone here saying, Pastor, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. It's not hard. Amen. Is there anyone here today that's saying, I've never done it, but I really want to. I'm not here to embarrass you, but I'm here to help you make heaven your home. Amen. Is anybody here? Hallelujah. Anyone here? Thank you, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Just want to make sure. Are you preparing for his coming? Are you ready? If you're here online today and you've not received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you want to, I'm here to pray with you. We're going to pray. You say this prayer with me this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. In your word, it says that if I repent of my sins and ask you to come into my heart, that you would remove all the sins that I ever committed. I'm asking you today to forgive me, to help me, to serve you. I want joy. I want peace. I want love. I want your love. Cover me and wash me clean. I believe that you died on the cross. And I believe that you rose again and that you're coming back. Thank you, Lord. For the joy of the Lord will be my strength. Amen.